Okay, thank you very much, Carrie. You make me blush. Um, <laughs> okay, in terms of content, unlike what the, the official title says, which I will be covering immunization safety in uh, low- and middle-income countries, that's not quite what I'm going to do. I'm going to cover the range of immunization safety issues and show you what the real issues are. I'm going to tell you what immunization safety is about and what should be done to guarantee immunization safety if we ever can. And I'm going to enlarge your, your view on that. And then I'm going to identify WHO's contribution and cover tools, guidance, initiatives. And all along, actually, what I'm going to say is relevant also to high-income countries, and you will be able to judge by yourself the differences and the similarities between low- and middle-income and high-income countries. So first, I'm going to take you for a tour, a journey, like, uh, and it'll be a, a booster dose after what you, you heard from Madav, going around the world for the last 25 years of issues that I picked voluntarily because I was involved with the investigation or it impacted on, on directly on my work. And also because I think this is fairly representative of what the issues are around the world. So starting by the issue of allegation of a link between hepatitis B vaccination and multiple sclerosis in France in 1998, already mentioned by, by Madave. What happens there is that all the Francophone countries started to refuse immunization with hepatitis B. In Egypt in 99, we were called to investigate three deaths that were labeled post-DPT encephalopathy. And why? Because at that time, even if the science was saying encephalopathy doesn't have, occur after DPT vaccination, it was still in some textbook. And there were these cases, and the people immediately blamed the vaccine. Whereas upon the investigation, it was not three cases, but 12 cases that we uncovered of death. And these were actually due to the application of alcohol, of red alcohol impregnated compresses at the site of injection, when the most careful parents were soaking the most and wrapping the legs of the babies. And actually what they didn't know is that that red alcohol was actually pure methanol derived from corn. So actually, tragically, they killed their babies, but it's tragic because the vaccine was blamed when actually the kids were mistreated and they're actually a good antidote to methanol, which is ethanol. Uh, sorry, I forgot. In Algeria in 2001, seven infants died from the use of a selenium vial instead of the measles vaccine diluent. How is that possible? Because it was a very high concentration of selenium intended for the lab. In Guinea, in 2002, a nurse was very well uh, caring of her friends and, uh, and family that she wanted to immunize them against yellow fever. So she took the vial at home that had already been used, left it out of the cold, and actually managed to kill two persons from the staph aureus contamination of the, of the vial. This is tragic. So moving to uh, other issues, in 2010, there was the detection of, uh, of uh, circovirus uh, in, the, in the rotavirus vaccine. This was an adventitious agent of no consequence whatsoever. But at the time, the testing that was applied was not able to identify the virus. Now, it would no longer be the, the case. And then we also heard about the allegations of hormone contaminations of vaccines in, in many countries. In Vietnam in 2012, there was the suspension of the use of the pentavalent vaccine following some coincidental deaths in children after vaccination. And believe me, once you start to recall a vaccine, it is extremely difficult to resume vaccination. So resuming vaccination in Vietnam, re-increasing coverage was extremely challenging. 
I will not mention Syria, which has already been mentioned at, at, at depth by Madav earlier today. In Kazakhstan in 2015, a cluster of anxiety reactions just destroyed the measles vaccination campaign. You've also heard already about the many coincidental deaths following the use of HPD vaccine in a great many countries and their potential impact. It was more or less or not so well managed depending on the, the country. So the impact on the vaccine coverage varied tremendously from one country to the other. In South Sudan in 2017, 15 children died from measles vaccine contaminated by syringe reuse. In 2019, in northern Pakistan, this was actually manipulation. There was a, a false, and, and some children were forced to lay down and complain that they were suffering from polio vaccination. And this actually triggered 25,000 children rushed to the hospital by the parent. And I won't dwell on the COVID-19 uh, uh, and all the many allegations in the midst of the true reactions that, that were uncovered. Before moving to the next slide, which I think is an extremely sobering slide, I want you to ponder on this one. So I'm now going to be switching to injection safety. And you have to keep in mind that vaccination represents a very small fraction of all injections that are administered every year, about 16 billion injections, actually way too many. And I would dare say, of course, I'm biased, that we are doing better in immunization in terms of safety than the rest of, of injections. I see people nodding, you're also biased. So the next slide, which I said was sobering, uh, it's about the global burden of unsafe injections and trying to look at the situation and progress. And you're going to tell me, well, it's not much uh, updated, your slide. Well, I'm sorry, but that's all what I can do. Because for the last 15 years, there hasn't been any effort to assess the global burden. This is tragic. But look, between 2000 and 2010, the reuse of injection equipment dropped from about 40% to 5%, major progress. And the reductions in unsafe therapeutic injections resulted in 87% decrease in HIV inf inf infections and 91% in HBV infections due to injections. If we look at the year 2008, the use of autodisable syringes in the context of immunization, I'll tell you more about this in a minute, prevented around 5,000 HIV infection and over 200 HBV infections. That's huge. And vaccination against hepatitis B itself actually prevented over 1.5 million uh, infections from unsafe injections. But in 2010, last year for which we still have estimates, there were still, you know, as an example, 230,000 HIV infections and 1.7 million HBV infections due to unsafe injections. Keep that in mind. So immunization safety is what? It's about the ensuring and monitoring the safety of all aspects of immunization, that it be vaccine quality, transport, storage, handling, vaccine administration, and the disposal of sharps. So what makes a vaccination safe? First, the development of safe vaccines and technologies. Second, the licensing and market authorization process. Three, the proper manufacture and supply. Fourth, the proper storage handling, administration, and waste management. And last and not least, the post-marketing surveillance of adverse events. So now what I will do is tell you a little bit about each of those components. Of course, what is already covered through other ADVAC lectures, I'm going to be scarce. There's no point to repeat. I'll tell you more about the bottom left orange box but I'll say a few things in the other boxes as well. 
So first, WHO has a goal of having 100% of the vaccines used in all the national immunization programs be of assured quality. So what is a vaccine of assured quality? That's a vaccine produced in a country with a functional regulatory authority meeting at least a maturity level three and independent from the vaccine manufacturer and vaccine for which there are no unresolved reported problem. All this is guided, the regulatory authorities work and that of the uh, vaccine manufacturing companies is guided by recommendations on safety, efficacy and quality issued by uh, the expert committee on biological standardization, which is one of the expert committees of WHO issuing both physical and written standards that are regularly published. For all my slides, I put references when I only have time because of the amount of the scope to do lip service to, to the different topics. So it's to tease you about those issues. You have already heard about the WHO prequalification on day one and day two of the course. And really, the purpose is to provide the UN purchasing agencies with an opinion on the quality, safety, of efficacy of vaccines and ensure that these products are suitable for the target populations and ensure the compliance with the, with the specifications and the standards. So it's relying on the vaccine producing regulatory authority. There's targeted testing in the field and also uh, a monitoring of complaints should there be complaints after the use of the vaccine. So that's the whole time I have to tell you about that. And I won't have any time to tell you about the pre-qualification of other immunization equipment, but to alert you that also there's an entire pre-qualification process led by WHO for the injection-related equipment. And that concerns syringes, but also fridges, cold boxes, and so on. So you can read more at your leisure. So what is a safe injection? A safe injection is an injection that does no harm to the recipient, that does no harm to the health worker. You have to protect yourself, but also no harm to the communities. So we don't want to see reuse of equipment. We don't want to see unsafe collection and syringes uh, laying around on dumps with kids are going to, uh, to collect them. In 1999, in the face of abundant reuse of injection devices of syringes and their paucity, WHO, UNICEF, and partners issued a statement on the safety of injection, calling for the exclusive use of autodisabled syringes in immunization. That statement was updated in 2019. It was updated to include the reuse prevention syringes for vaccine reconstitution, that essentially the only change that took place. And please note that that policy is calling for the use of AD syringes, but also is a bundling policy, i.e. when you deliver a vaccine dose, you deliver it with one syringe, needle, and the necessary number of uh, disposal boxes uh, that are necessary to run your immunization uh, practice or, or campaign. Initially, people were against the auto-disabled syringes because they were saying, well, we have few pre-qualified, it costs a lot. Currently, it's all bullshit. You have about the same cost uh, between the disposal and the standard syringes. And now there are over 55 pre-qualified syringes. There are also syringes uh, with shops injury prevention features. So where you shield the, the needle after the injection or where the needle retracts in the barrel. They cost a bit more. And uh, you have, again, the reuse prevention devices that are used for therapeutic injections. Uh, they're essentially the same as the auto-disabled syringes, but they are graduated to be able to take the right amount of the, of the medication. And we prefer actually syringes where you activate the mechanism to prevent the reuse at the very start of pushing on the, on the piston. 
So many syringes with COVID, there was a little problem early on with the 0.1 ml, but, but believe me, we're well equipped, well covered now with these devices. So no excuse not to use them. So are the auto-disabled syringes uh, an answer to all safety issues? No, because AD stands only for auto-disabled. It doesn't stand for auto-destructible or auto-disposable. So it doesn't prevent actually the, some uh, additional risks. Now I'm going to move to, again, handling the vaccine and, and practice. So here you have four vials. I'm going to ask you to be spot. Uh, somebody asked you to vote earlier today. And I saw many of you were shy and didn't want to, to raise the or you were too slow. So here you have four vials. And of course, people who don't know how to read, but it's more than that. It's also the, the different language. Or right? at times we are so in much in a hurry that, that, that we don't pay attention to the vial we take out of the fridge. We are used to taking it from a certain place. So here are four vials, and one of these is not a vaccine. So be spot and raise your hand if you think it's it's the first vial. Okay, about five voting. Vial two, who is in favor of vial two not being a vaccine? One. Okay, I don't see many courageous people or actually maybe you'll vote more for three and four. So what about vial three? Okay, so you think it's vial three. And vial four, a few brave people. So believe it or not, but actually the answer is it was vial two, the one that got the least vote. So congratulations to our friend from PNG. Uh, okay, just an illustration that, that we have to be very careful because they all look alike. Okay, you need to pay attention to the reconstitution. You need to follow the open vial policy. So WHO has uh, pushed for that technology with a thermochromic label. If it's on the cap, you need to discard the vial after six hours. If it's on the, on the size of the vial, then you can keep it open for, for 28 days. Another important thing is to use the proper injection technique, including pain mitigation approaches, which is dear to Noni, and you will hear more from her uh, very soon. Then you need to collect the, 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 the syringes, and, and you need to have disposal boxes like this one and drop your syringe in there directly at the site of injection and not push like crazy and not overfill, otherwise you're going to get injured. And then you have technologies also to potentially uh, cut the needle, and, uh, and, and there are many, uh, many solutions. So here are some good and some bad practices. First, two-hand recapping, never do it. Even if you think you're skilled, you're going to injure yourself. Checking packages is a good idea. Leaving the needle like that in the uh, uh, septum is really bad. You don't help. And I already mentioned the issue of the shop boxes. So there have been a lot of progress, but there's still progress to make. We have a rotation of staff, and we need continued training, advocacy, information, education, communication. We need attention and resources. And you see in uh, New Jersey in 2015, so in the U.S., actually a nurse, uh, managed to immunize 67 people with only two syringes. And uh, I don't remember what the exact number of doses of uh, flu vaccine was, but I think it was uh, only 20 doses. So I don't need to uh, dwell on the, on the problem. She was well intended. She wanted to immunize people. Waste management. Waste management is necessary. We need to pay attention. There are challenges. We have two important conventions, the Stockholm on the pollutants and the Basel Convention, which is more on don't pollute your neighbor. Uh, there's definitely environmental concerns and bans on burning in some countries. And we don't have the magic bullet. We don't have the magic solution. But we have solutions all over. It's a question of being pragmatic and adapting the solution to the setting. So at places, 
the solution is to bury things in a pit or encapsulate in concrete. And also at places, it's about recycling of syringes. I need to, to, to get moving. Now, in terms of international strategies, what has been promoted for some time was the incineration. Incineration in small-scale incinerators. And I would dare say, I mean, it's still okay. We're moving away from that. But if you have this, that's still better that, that throwing the, the, the syringes out. And after all, people are still burning tires uh, and nobody seems to care about. But there's a movement to burning in more wider scale incinerators that go to higher temperature. And the preferred solution is really the, the autoclaving uh, as the best, but it's not uh, available all over. Practical solution, you see the picture at the bottom right. Actually, it's the yellow fever vaccination campaign in, uh, in, uh, around Kinshasa in, uh, in Congo. And they had an agreement with a concrete factory and they transported over 10 tons of, uh, of uh, used syringes to be incinerated at the, at the factory. So now let's talk in the last few minutes about the, uh, another box, that of the global, uh, monitoring and the, uh, importance of pharmacovigilance, which is a priority and a challenge that we have seen today in many countries. The country is being faced with many different priorities and conflicting priorities at times. So, of course, the countries are at the middle. They are at the heart of the action, but they need help. And WHO and partners are helping, and they are helping in a different way in building uh, global, cap in uh, helping build capacity and having harmonized tools. We have heard about the Brighton collaboration uh, right in the previous lecture. Um, we have heard already about the, the SIAMS working group. Um, we have, uh, I'll, you have heard about the global vaccine safety, uh, blueprint, uh, by Nick. Then there's the product monitoring, the involvement important of the manufacturers, of the licensing authorities, of the procurement agencies. We have the global analysis and response. And I'll say a word about GACs on the next slide or that after and other global and regional advisory bodies. And we have the global signal evaluation and detection. Uh, and some of these uh, boxes have already, already been uh, mentioned in previous, uh, in previous lectures. So I don't have time to go through everything. I just want to zoom on one I think is important. So that slide, it's important. It's about setting objectives for low and middle income countries. But these are only objectives, okay? Now, I won't dwell because Nick has talked to you a lot about this, but you have the references, and, and you can go through that document, which is in its second uh, version. Now, I want to say a word about something which uh, uh, Carrie mentioned, and I think it's extremely important. It's the Global Advisory Committee on Vaccine Safety, which is, again, another advisory body to WHO to respond to vaccine safety issue of potential global importance quickly and with scientific rigor and credibility. So the committee has broad expertise and independence and look at evidence-based uh, recommendation and the best evidence. So I'm stressing that because it's not necessarily published evidence. And it's important at time to issue recommendation, even if you don't have something published, which at times will take another year. Uh, another piece which I think is important is the vaccine safety net. Vaccine safety net is a global network of websites evaluated by WHO that provide reliable information on vaccine safety. So it is really to help the parents, the people lost like me on the internet to identify the proper sources of information and try to counteract the active anti-immunization lobby. So there were criteria developed by the GACs about credibility, content, accessibility, and design. These have been recently revised, but to make it short, the mandatory criteria are about credibility and content, and the other are more desired criteria. And that network, which was established about 20 years ago, 
is now composed of 104 uh, members, websites, so to speak, from 44 countries, and which release information in 36 different languages. And in there, there are governmental institutions, professional associations, and, and so forth. So there's a great variety. I think that's something that when we talk about communication is extremely useful. So I cannot finish this presentation without talking about the special case of the mass vaccination campaign. You have already heard about some of these elements we've heard from Madav earlier today. The problem of the campaigns is that you immunize so many people over such a short period of time that even if nothing was changed, you have the impression of a raise in the number of adverse events reported. Often there's also more vigilance, either for good reasons or bad reasons, when somebody wants to torpedo a campaign. Also, at times, you target different age groups, so you are not familiar with what to expect in terms of background rate of conditions after that. There may also be a real rise in programmatic errors. Why? Because at times, there's pressure put on the people to immunize so many persons per day, or there is new staff that lacks expertise. We have seen that with COVID tremendously, actually, at the beginning of the, of the vaccination And there's an increased risk of negative impact of rumors. I won't mention again the uh, stress-related uh, uh, response, which is a big issue in the context of campaign. And the adverse events are also used to criticize a, a campaign and torpedo it, and not to mention the huge amount of ways to dispose it. So to conclude and recap, to ensure immunization safety, what is needed? Well, what is needed is all of that. Exclusive use of vaccines of ensured quality. Prevention of reuse of needles and syringes through AD syringes and adequate stocks of syringes, but also disposal boxes. You need the proper disposal of waste. You need the appropriate waste management. You need the continued training and supervision of staff. We need an effective AFI monitoring and management with international collaboration. We need appropriate handling of safety issues and rumors, and we need very much collaboration. But what we need ab above all right now is your advocacy. Okay, you as alumni have a critical role to play. I showed you, I said it's tragic. It seems that we have dropped the ball 10 years ago. And I hope that, that some of you can help carry the ball and finish the job, because even if we have tremendously improved things, it's just unacceptable to continue to have people that are infected because of the wrong type of injection. Thank you. Thank you, Philip. Lovely lecture. Uh, we always get a task from Phil, and you just got one. <laughs> okay, questions? Yes, please. Thank you. Wonderful presentation. This is Cristiana from Italy. Um, I wanted to ask a, a question about uh, manufacturing, ma manufacturers' role, in the sense that you, you indicated that in, in a slide that they are important for uh, product monitoring, of course, and for ensuring that the quality of the product is uh, appropriate. Do they also have a role in issue solving or, uh, let's say, in building tools because they know about in use stability of products? Uh, they have a lot of knowledge uh, also from development history of the product. Can you clarify if you have... Well, I'll make my answer uh, brief and to the point. Yes. I mean, I can do much more, but uh, yes, there's, there's really a role for, for industry. I mean, are they formally involved or is it more? Well, it depends. It depends at places when you involve uh, industry. I mean, you involve, uh, need to involve industry the right way with the right uh, boundaries. Uh, 
So if you, I take an example, uh, when you have the uh, meetings of the Global Advisory Committee on Vaccine Safety, I mean, we clearly used to invite uh, industry to the table, present their data, their views, and so forth. You may agree or disagree with industry. You may, um, yeah. So, but you're right. Uh, if your point is at times uh, industry is left too much on the side, I mean, there are many settings when I think it's uh, unfortunately the case. That's the spirit of ADVAC. That gives you here a free forum for discussion between regulators, industry, colleagues from academia. And, and that's the power of ADVAC, of, of being able to speak outside of the boundaries that at times one is imposing for good reasons, of course, but at times are real unfortunate barriers. If I may add, Phil, to that, uh, so in Europe, all, uh, all vaccines that are authorized, they have a risk management plan, and they often require studies by industry, and also regulators uh, require reports at least every six months uh, to be submitted mm. and reviewed by the regulator. So there are lots of roles for industry yeah. in the vaccine safety we field, and... Uh, um, maybe we should actually make the risk management plans more public. Uh, I, I would like to see that. They were very much public uh, during the last pandemic, and they've been public now, but they're not public for all vaccines. Uh, but it's helpful for public health to, what, to know what the regulators want us to monitor. I mean, there's no point to reinvent the wheel and have industry have their parallel monitoring system and the government. You need to exchange. That's what we started to do uh, many years ago in Canada, and that's important. But you don't want to keep your data for yourself and not share with industry. We could talk hours on that topic. Please. Thank you very much for that wonderful presentation. So I think um, in lower and middle income countries, especially in Sub-Saharan Africa, cold chain management is a challenge. Uh, I'm not particularly convinced that WHO is doing enough to monitor adverse events that might be related to uh, poor preservation of vaccines. Thank you. I don't know what your thoughts are. Well, my thoughts agree with you. Um, th there's been a lot that has been done, you know, like the, the, the vaccine vial monitors uh, the, in, in, and the cold chain, it can go both ways. At times it's too cold. When we did a survey in Canada, what we discovered that our vaccine was actually not frozen. It was exposed to too much heat because the people wanted to protect the vaccine from freezing and actually they were doing the opposite. So you find weird things. Uh, it, it's less of a risk of contamination, but it's a risk of having a vaccine that's inefficient, which in turn is a major issue. And actually, I would dare say an immunization safety issue as well at large. Um, and uh, often, again, there, there's been you, you'll hear about the cold chain and uh, there's a parallel session next week and you can take the people and see if there is enough attention. And I would say for many of these ancillary programmatic issues that are extremely important, I think we're dropping the ball. I think there's enough, not enough attention. Please. Thanks. That's a lovely talk, uh, Divya, and welcome. Um, I just wondered, you mentioned a lot about the kind of waste that's generated from immunizations. Um, are you aware of any innovations to kind of reduce the environmental impact that are going on perhaps by manufacturers? Uh, well, th there are innovations in, uh, in, in vaccines. There's the work on the on the uh, transdermal uh, uh, vaccine, we're not there yet, but when it's out, when it'll be there available, it'll be a major uh, uh, progress. Um, anything, any way that moves away from the syringe and avoids the stigma of the injection is also, in a way, a good move. Now, if you were talking about not about the vaccines, but about the the uh, injection equipment or about uh, the waste disposal approaches, there have been new technologies like jet injectors, uh, new versions, not the old style which I benefited from and which contaminated you with blood uh, one after the other, but where you actually change the nozzle. There are a couple such uh, of things that are pre-qualified. Uh, but there are also, uh, there were methods that were low-hanging fruits, like uh, like the melting of the syringes and, and using the the bugs then to build houses in uh, in low-income countries. I don't know why it seemed to interest nobody. 
Okay, so there have been much progress on the on the recycling front, on ensuring that the syringes are, are PVC free, that type of thing, to avoid generation of uh, of dioxins and uh, and furans. Uh, but there are not enough innovation. You know, it's a bit like like um, cars and gas. Okay, we have an approach, and once we have the approach, we go in that only direction, and uh, and we forget all new developments. So we need more. We need your advocacy. Sorry to repeat myself. Please. Thanks, Maya from Gavi. Um, how is waste management monitored, and who is kept accountable for it, and especially the climate effects? You want my, my answer? That's the answer. That was the answer. No, uh, that was the answer that nothing much is happening. It's, it's happening where you have, I, I should not be as drastic and say nothing is happening, but there are places and good, good, a good, uh, we have uh, immunization managers as, as colleagues here, participants. And hopefully they could say that they are monitoring, that, that the, the staff is well trained and that, that the proper monitoring and supervision. And it's actually probably much better done in, in many places, uh, in low and middle income countries that it is actually done in high income countries. But I've seen, you know, a place, for instance, where it was actually in Syria at the time before the, uh, the, the tragic situation. And there was a nurse and I go, in the in, in the clinic where she was immunizing. And the nurse does the right thing because she had been supervised, she had been told what to do. She immunized with the AD syringes, takes the AD syringes in the disposal box and, and, and does it all. And then, you know, we're done because I was just looking at immunization, but I say, what, what is that room? And that room was actually the room for the other type of care, okay? And I see the same nurse doing an injection with uh, a syringe, I don't remember what it was, taking the syringe and basically putting the syringe in the trash can, open like that. So it, at times it's it's challenging and it's very important to have the monitoring and the supervision. If you don't train, you don't monitor, you don't supervise, you don't go nowhere. That's why we need surveillance. That's why we need the monitoring of adverse events. Otherwise, if you don't measure it, it doesn't get done. That's why we need measuring coverage. Otherwise, you don't know what's happening and you don't, you don't want to improve. Sorry, I'm long with my answers. As I'm aging, I'm getting longer with the answers. Yes, please. Thanks, Philip, for that great talk. Um, I, you're raising an important point here about me yeah um <laughs> advocacy um and i guess i feel like it's a chicken and egg circle here because the lack of evidence reduces how much you can advocate and you need advocacy to do implementation research and generate innovation so what's the solution because it's not many there's not much funding out there for programmatic questions and implementation well, i don't, I don't see why there wouldn't be actually there was at the time when we initiated some special project and there was signed the safe injection global network and then these were mainstream in patient safety and then it seems that the whole interest disappeared i put on the repository actually a paper by colleagues from uh, egypt uh it seemed that's the only paper recent paper i could find it's not looking at global burden but in egypt at least they are continuing to monitor and see the gaps and we need that. We need money. Uh, so you can also advocate for uh, for money. And then we need the studies. And the studies will actually hopefully lead to more money. I, I'm, we're getting too long, so we need to switch. But at the break, those of you who have never seen an AD syringe or a needle cutter, please come here and I'll demonstrate if there is any interest. Thank you. There's no rush. If you want to take uh, Yes, the, the boss. Oh. Ah, oh, sorry. Sorry. I mean, I thought that Camel was waving at me. No, no, no. So I'm, I was trying to be obedient to him. I'm not that mean. Now, my question, Philippe, is uh, you mentioned, I mean, you mentioned a lot that there is a lack of interest around this question of uh, of uh, safety injection. Uh, what is your analysis? Why? I mean, because that's like uh, uh, thousands of thousands of, of uh, injection uh, happening every day. 
So why, I mean, you see that it's it, double it, level, we didn't, it, it, we don't I, have any more. I, I think it's not sexy. Again, there was the concept of mainstreaming. It should be integrated as part of something else. And I think that was the kiss of death for one. Then I'm, I'm looking actually at our colleague from Gavi, and I hope that, that she's really uh, uh, listening and listening to the, the point made about the, uh, the lack of funding resources and so forth. And there was a time, which I hope has, has way changed, when uh, beyond the provision of a vaccine doses bundle, uh, actually there was no uh, or not much investment actually for these uh, what I would call ancillary tasks that make a program or can make a program a good program and support countries. So I would encourage the continued discussion. I would be interested to know. And I was looking for Gurung in the room because uh, – Oh, oh, here you are. So I don't know if you wanted to comment because you came from a, a, a regional uh, office. Now you're headquarters. Um, again, at times I'm frustrated. I, we discuss, we exchange our frustrations with, uh, with Madav earlier today. Uh, and, and you may feel, uh, you, you know, to say something if you think enough is done or not enough and how to re-stimulate things. So sorry to put the finger at you, but... Uh, would you like to say something? Yeah. And feel free to disagree with me. Uh, sorry, I missed the, uh, the question. This is regarding the AEFI in the. No, it was it was really regarding the resources and the and and the lack of uh, the point that Kamel was making. I was I was repeating that there is now a lack of attention to um, injection safety and to waste disposal uh, within WHO, but but beyond. And the question why why is that and how to to change that how to regain course if what I'm saying is right, which you may disagree with, and then I'll be extremely pleased. I will have win my day. No, absolutely. I think I, I do agree with you. And uh, uh, I think when we're even just from the routine perspective, from the campaign, campaign perspective, we're investing on the injection safety and the waste management. It's always included in the gli guidelines. But like, I think when we're talking about allocating resources or something, it's always on the on the hindered side, right? Like, so there is definitely that aspect that uh, the resource allocation i think even when you're when you're submitting an application for gavi right like um, for a campaign that you want to run in a country uh, if there is uh, the the case that you make for the vaccine plus the programmatic and the operations but the waste management component is always the the very small component so i think yeah i, I do agree with you thank you please just I wanted to share um, uh, an experience from the field. I think it's about words. We have to use the the, the good words, and uh, because words have uh, uh, weight and puissance. So in uh, in Morocco, for the national immunization program, we used to train the nurses who uh, actually inject the the vaccine and give them like manual like a book to read and uh, to follow the practices. No, and. Usually they don't have time to open it after the training, you know, they don't revise it because they are overwhelmed. But when you change the term of manual to good practice and to give them a checklist, what, what to do, when to do, they are happy to fill it, you know, and it's like a new task, but they accept it. So it's not, it's only the way to, uh, to, uh, give them, uh, their routine to work with them, their routine to change world. And this task was, uh, task was completely integrated daily. So it, it was a little experience at that because I'm working in, um, like a primary health care to do the, field training for my students, but we can, we can maybe do this, uh, little, uh, change and, uh, it could, uh, help. Please, last question. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much. Mine is a short comment. Um, I, I mean, especially around the, uh, waste management, needle management, injection management and all that. I think one of the challenges that we are having is some kind of a siloed kind of approach to vaccines and immunization. So we put a lot of emphasis on training on how to handle all these things. I mean, the example you gave of the nurse who is doing the right thing here, but goes the other side and does the wrong thing. 
for her, it seems to be okay because nobody is actually emphasizing that. Nobody is pushing that. So I, I think as we go, I mean, as we go into this, as we look at training, let's not only look at training the people who are vaccinated as it should be everybody in the clinic, in the health environment. Mm. That's the only way we can check, uh, change. Because the AD syringes, for example, they came through vaccines. It took a long time to actually have them in the clinical practice. But eventually they got there. So I, I think we need to really yeah. look beyond the immunization programs and look at the other clinical areas. I, I think you're 100% right. Actually, when we were doing the, the, the immunization safety priority project, we're working hand in hand with, with the, the safe injection global network. The, um, the challenge is, and, and I think when, when WHO decided to mainstream and, and, uh, not treat vaccines separately, but, but injections, it was with good intent. But then they also did that about injection safety. It's not injection safety, it's patient safety. So you do that also with good intent for the reason that you mentioned. But the problem is at the end, you dilute. And, and, and you eventually lack the champions um, and you lack the focused attention. And why actually vaccination had succeeded was because of the attention. And so it's a double-edged sword and it's um, part of, you know, it's, it, it's uh, we, we could again discuss for hours, but your point is right. Thank you, Philip. Fantastic session.